Max Gallardi, or Hot Diggity Demon, has sustained a divisive legacy amongst the internet animation community. While many heralded Max as one of the funniest internet personalities with a sharp and ironic edginess, many find this off-putting and have had a hard time looking past more of his problematic moments. Despite this, there is one series in his catalog that stands above the rest and is often unsung. There was Max G's most conceptual and interesting web series about a captive misanthropic criminal and his disdain for video games. Wacky game jokes for kids. While the series has been long dead and most certainly won't see a continuation, mostly in part to Max making the entire series private on YouTube, its premise and satire has found itself materializing in real-world media, making this series prophetic in nature. So let's go take a look at Wacky Game Jokes for Kids in retrospect, and analyze its message and themes along the way, while looking at something contemporary as well. Mickey is a small-time crook in the slums of NYC Stolen off the streets by an evil corporation called BGB He is forced to write the They're about video games. Mickey also plans his media escapes. It's wacky game jokes for kids. Wacky Game Jokes for Kids is a 10-episode series about Mickey the Dick, a small-time crook in the streets of NYC that gets kidnapped and is forced to create and star in video game content for the evil corporation VGV, which is an acronym for Video Game Videos. Mickey is extremely apprehensive to video games and actively undermines his abductor's wishes, while his willing co-workers Eric, a fat nerd who is also a robot, and June, a flagrantly unintelligent token gamer girl which makes Mickey's life a living hell. The bulk of the episodes revolve around a certain topic, which in turn becomes a self-referential parody or developing meta-narrative around the characters. Wacky Game Jokes for Kids premiered its first episode on February 16th, 2010, and ended with its 10th and final episode on September 25th, 2010. This entire series predates all creators like Dorkly. Keep that in mind for later in the video. Despite its priority being comedic or satirical, the overarching narrative about the hyper-realization of shitty video game content on places like YouTube is opaque in hindsight. Video game parodies were littered everywhere around this time, seeing as they were profitable to make and were the main source of popularity for most animators from this time, which Max G would find himself being in this category. The way the series presented its messages felt like it was commentary from the future. Some of the wacky stuff that happens in the series feels like it can be applied to some contemporary media. While Wacky Game Jokes for Kids is undoubtedly in and of itself a video game parody parody, it's so ironically detached and contemptuous of that microgenre that it's barely about video games to begin with. It's all about Mickey as a character coming to terms with his imprisonment, having to deal with people he hates, and especially having to make videos about something he really hates. Before I go into the full analysis, please go ahead and watch the entire series. It's short, only having 10 main episodes along with some fan mail episodes and promos for the finale that never materialized. Max's brand of satire often does not leave much to subtlety. Or having a mental deficiency, like Down syndrome or something. And yeah, before you say anything, yes, I am likening homosexuality to having Down syndrome. The show is clearly about the lucrative but superficial creation of video game parodies. Around the time the series released, video game parodies were on the uptick. The awesome series by Ego Raptor pervaded most of Newgrounds and YouTube in the late 2000s and early aughts. Compounded with the world of internet video becoming more lucrative, video game parodies became a staple in the content rotation around this time. Video game parodies, and especially web cartoons, had a more blunt edge approach to their satire of the video game industry. What was usually being used as a vehicle for commentary was always something you can discern from the text. 
Max G's aptitude for interwoven satire and parody is fully present in wacky game jokes. For instance, Mickey reviews Lord of the Flies as a video game, analyzing the gameplay elements of something that can't really be interfaced as a game. Despite how stupid of a premise this episode is, Max was ruminating on gamers having a less intellectual aptitude and well-rounded wealth of knowledge on other media. So anyway, I eventually did figure out how to get the game going, which is weird because apparently I didn't even need the Wii. It didn't make a lick of sense, but honestly it's hard to complain because without the Wii, the game becomes extremely portable. I played it in my bed, in the bathtub, outside. Well, not outside, in the basement holodeck, but you get the idea. Usually with these portable games you have to worry about the sun glaring on the screen or whatever, but for some reason that never was a problem for me. It was almost like the more sun it got, the easier it was to see. In tandem with that example, one of the best episodes of Wacky Game Jokes for Kids is entirely about deconstructing video game fan culture through the lens of Paul Thomas Anderson's film, There Will Be Blood. Spoilers, Max G recreates the ending of There Will Be Blood, almost shot for shot, using the struggle for power between Daniel and Eli, but recontextualized through the lens of Mario vs. Sonic. False prophets! Sniveling boys! I am the third revelation! I am the third revelation! Sniveling boy! I am the third revelation! I am the third revelation! There Will Be Blood is about the transactional nature between faith and capitalism at a turning point in American history. In Wacky Game Jokes for Kids, the messaging here is about the nature of online fan content and its artistic merit. Max G equating Mario and Sonic to the struggle between Daniel and Eli is purposefully disingenuous. It ends up alluding more to a completely unrelated piece of media to show how overdone the parody is to begin with. Even in 2010, the Mario vs. Sonic rivalry was overdone, and was only used to evoke feelings of nostalgia. Max probably knew that people would be alienated from this video, and made it as obtuse as possible. People just wanted to see Mario and Sonic duke it out while some schmuck animates it for them. And Mario and Sonic are literally just symbols in this story, they're not even really characters. Mickey and Eric are literally just wearing the costumes while the title of the video is just Mario vs. Sonic. Its messaging is clear before it even gets to the film it's referencing. At this point, people knew what they were getting out of Max G and his content, so this wasn't too surprising, but even now, after a decade, people don't seem to get what Max was going for with this video, or even get that this was a There Will Be Blood reference. For 2010, this is some interesting and dense storytelling and satire. Wacky Game Joke's satirical efficacy is prominently displayed by how Max G characterizes each member of the cast. Mickey is the jaded outsider that finds the entire corporate boondoggle that is VGV intolerable. And from my perspective, Max G's surrogate character. If brained up is anything to go by, Max is one bitter man. And that isn't necessarily a bad thing. Max G is an incredible artistic and technical talent. His animations and display of skills, especially his rate of improvement through the years, is remarkable. That being said, and this is just speculation, having to reduce his imagination to making fun of video games to get noticed on the internet can make someone jaded real fast. If you don't mind me adding more baseless conjecture, Mickey the Dick's affect is like Max G's current character in Brain Dump. And I do mean a character. Max G is playing up himself in Brain Dump, but it is ultimately a character at the end of the day. Max and Mickey carry the same wayward, cynical demeanor, one with more window dressing than the other. But I'll be covering those similarities between Brain Dump and Wacky Game Jokes a bit later. Mickey isn't afraid to punch below the belt or get a little dirty, especially in the episode where he interviews Egoraptor, someone who has, unintentionally or not, contributed to video game parodies being the go-to content at the time. Uh, so, Ego, you know, a lot of these uh, internet animator types, you know, they make these cartoons, they put them on the internet, it's, you know, it's some funny shit. And, you know, they, they always, uh, you know, inject a lot of humor into their animations. Um, why, why don't you do that, Aaron? Why don't you do that? Uh, well, I work very hard on my cartoons, and um, I realize they're not to, to everyone's taste. But personally, I, I, do, I, I do believe that they're funny, but it's a style of humor that's not for everybody. Well... It's cute that you think that. Max G used Mickey as a vehicle for what I can only ascertain as contempt for gaming culture at the time. Moving on to another character, Eric is a robot. 
literally and figuratively. Eric is what is often perceived as the typical no-life gamer. Unambitious, unattractive, unwilling to compromise on his display of affection for geek culture, to a detriment. His devotion to video games as a medium other him from the rest of society, affording him the naivety he often displays when Mickey is behaving in an unruly way, or can't understand why Mickey wouldn't want the job of starring in video game videos. Gaming and gaming culture only recently infiltrated the mainstream, seeing as it's one of the leading sources of revenue in entertainment today. Back when this series was made, some of gaming culture was still treated as an insular club with many gatekeepers. While Eric isn't brutish by any means, there are several moments throughout the series where his pride for knowing gaming knowledge overtakes his lack of perspective in a social situation. The idea was that, like, it's Mario, but, like, he's in the real world, and, like, he's, like, down on his luck, and it's all gritty and serious, and it's, like, it's funny because it's the juxtaposition of, like, the cute, lovable Mario characters, but it's, like, all gritty and real and dark. Don't you think that that would be funny? Eric being a robot is a direct analog to how gamers uphold their culture. Having a blind adherence to a hobby or piece of media creates an unsavory stereotype. Eric's unkempt appearance and general behavior is that of someone who spends too much time playing video games. I apologize if I sound judgmental, but Eric is the exaggerated dissolution of all of these types of people. I'm not making fun of people's appearances out of malice, but this is why gamers, or now what we call hardcore gamers, have a bad reputation. They are often unkempt, reek of body odor, and have an unmotivated wardrobe. You know, washed out denim jeans, unfit screen tee, and the worst offender? New Balance sneakers. Eric is the embodiment of that image, which can be just as unflattering as June's. June is an interesting case because her characterization and place within wacky game jokes as subtext can be interpreted in many ways, not to mention what influenced this character creation in the first place. June is the gamer girl, who for a lack of a better way to describe it, is a hired gun made to posture as one. June is ditzy, obnoxious, and flowery, much to her detriment. She is often unaware of the greater issues going on with the characters, such as Mickey's attitude towards the situation and the lack of civility between Eric and Mickey. Her lack of gaming knowledge and actual qualifications for the job are often picked apart by the other characters. The series and characters don't explicitly say it, but June is more of a jab on companies and corporations' hiring habits. I'm bad at video games because I'm a girl, but no, and I will beat you at Super Brawl Brothers if you do not believe me and I... I am good at video games, and I will beat you! June is presumably very attractive, but also relatable enough to get people to watch more of VGV's product. June may have a cursory knowledge on gaming culture, and may even enjoy gaming herself, but the series makes a point to show you that that's not the reason she has the job. While the usual response to stuff like this by gamers, especially back then, is to direct vitriol towards the person and the people who hired her, Max G treads this a little more carefully than he usually does, with not making June totally one-dimensional. Not really in her character, but how the rest of the cast interacts with her. I don't give a shit about whether or not you think this episode is funny. I don't I care. Don't, I don't even want to have my name on something that, that I don't feel like it meets my par of quality. Par of quality? You have a par of quality? Max wasn't necessarily partial to either side of the argument. Instead, these interactions are to illustrate the futility of the argument entirely. While video game content from big media was sort of vapid at the time, and still is, there was nothing wrong with having women be involved in gaming culture, especially for media. Even at its worst when it's just eye candy, it's good marketing, as long as they don't hypersexualize their subjects. The problem was, video game content like that often was and helped create awful situations like these. Oh my god, you, what, you don't look at the clock, Miranda? I do, but it goes by so fast. All right. I really don't the next time you make a mistake like that, I'm gonna smell you. Real close, too. I'm gonna do it for your boyfriend. Oh, Shout out to your boyfriend. Don't say that. What's his name? I'm gonna say his name while I'm smelling you. Don't say that. While I can see how June might be a misogynistic dog whistle, I think her inclusion is great commentary on discourse around women in gaming. And what I mean by that is that I think Max saw June as a symbol for how possessive gamers on each side of the argument can get with women in gaming. I'd like to remind you that this is my subjective analysis, and I can totally be wrong, but 
That's what I read from the series. Given Max G's interesting approach to satire, I wouldn't be surprised if he wanted June to represent this touchy subject matter. The boss's purpose in the narrative is abundantly clear. He represents the corporation looking to capture some revenue from the growing popularity of gaming culture. He conceived wacky game jokes for kids out of a cynical need to appeal to both demographics, which becomes even more ironic that he is forcing Mickey the Dick to do it in the first place. The boss is meant to display a severe lack of intelligence. The boss is seen reprimanding Mickey often, only to see his behavior become more and more violent. While the boss is supposed to be painted as an intimidating figure for Mickey, he is effectively useless. The boss can't whip Mickey back into shape, no matter how hard he tries. It's as if everything he's doing is useless. And I'm onto something with that. Let me draw comparisons between Mickey and Max again for a moment, because I believe the core thesis of Wacky Game Jokes for Kids is that VGV represents what the internet wants us to see versus what Max wants to make. In order to get the attention of those who may better use his talents, or even get an audience to watch his cartoons, he has to submit himself to making what is popular. Mickey the Dick being a dangerous small-time crook illustrates Max G's helplessness. In order to get any traction, you have to make what people want to see, even if you think it sucks. Max G's development of the Dot Move series in part confirms this theory, seeing as it would go on to be the most popular work at the time. From a broader perspective, and detaching ourselves from the characters, the show is blatantly mean-spirited and borders on anti-humor for a reason. It's not only a parody of video game parodies, but may be a critical response to their popularity as a whole. The internet is an incredible platform for sharing cartoons, the thing that Max G is arguably the most passionate about. Along with people like Harry Partridge, Max G has always been in the upper echelon of technical and artistic skill. If we take a brief look through all of his work, there's a significant increase in animation and technical quality each time. You're probably saying to yourself, well, yeah, no shit, people get better at things, but... Max G's rate of improvement goes from amateur to professional very fast throughout his catalog. Seeing peers around him in gaming culture incessantly creating video game parodies probably put a strain on Max, hence why he would end up doing them later on. Which leads to my next point. Max G's aptitude for poignant parody is understated, but his foresight is even more unsung. While the culture around video game media was already superficial and was contingent on lowbrow humor, see for example Dorkly and a myriad of other webcomics, Max G presented a deeper narrative and a bit of a character study for Mickey. Wacky Game Jokes for Kids' main legacy was its ability to accurately predict where gaming-based internet content was heading. With the advent of YouTube's fiduciary success and the subsequent onslaught of video game parodies that were going to hit the platform, it was only a matter of time until we got something in real life on the caliber of VGV. I've talked about Dorkly on this channel, and well, you know what my opinion is if you've seen that video. Revisiting that same topic in a different context years later, I find it impossible not to make comparisons between the fictional company VGV and Dorkly. While I'm certain Dorkly doesn't kidnap small-time crooks on the street of New York City to make their content, that would imply that they would be a tad bit competent, I can't help but feel that the production meetings and conversations about Dorkly's content were as short-sighted as a VGV skit. It's no surprise that Dorkly itself is a conglomerate of college humor, making the corporate satire of VGV protrude in a contemporary viewing. This might be funnier if Brawl didn't come out two years ago. <sighs> who cares? This show is really going downhill. You can't go downhill when you start at the bottom of the hill, you nitwit. While Dorkly isn't the only example, it certainly is the most egregious. The content from Dorkly feels like it could be made from an Eric or a June. Dorkly's presentation and cheap situational humor perfectly illustrate Max G's point with wacky game jokes for kids. It's way too easy to make these types of videos and make a hefty profit off them. The risk-reward factor is negligible. VGV's entire motive is profit. Companies like Dorkly see the writing on the wall. Video games will be the biggest industry. Being at the forefront of that means you have the best advantage. With the growing ubiquity of the internet, video games, and meme culture, you'd be stupid not to try and capitalize on it. However, the unintended side effect of all this is how blatantly cynical and greedy it all seemed. While people initially liked Dorkly, video game parodies and content in the same vein became ridiculed over time for being low effort. Just look at Racist Mario. The worst video on the internet! Besides animation taking some effort, 
it is one of the laziest video game parodies ever made. But that view count tells an entirely different story. Some of these videos haven't even been parodied through the lens of irony. They are so much of a product of their time that they can't even be enjoyed ironically anymore. Wacky game jokes for kids, even though it has its own antiquated elements, can be enjoyed through hindsight. VGV was doomed to fail because it was based on a short-sighted premise, not because it hired incompetent workers. To be funny with parody, it must speak to something contemporary. Making jokes about Mario Kart with violence would only be funny to a bunch of 12-year-olds. But, uh, oh. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> XG was right about gaming culture. God, it sucks. Maybe that's why Max never truly finished wacky game jokes for kids. Maybe its commentary is futile despite its interesting premise. Or it could be the mundane creative person trope of wanting to move on to something different. And in Max's case, I'd assume the latter. Despite Max dropping the project, there were a ton of ideas and storyboards for Season 2. The only hint we got towards any season structure were the finale promos, which were all just references to other pieces of media, such as the first promo being related to Lost. In July of 2013, a user on Tumblr asked MaxG's page about the future of Wacky Game Jokes for Kids, to which he responded. Okay, so Mickey was once a member of the street game called The Dicks. The initiation into the gang is that members have to get an ink tattoo around their eyes so they look sunken and dark, which is why Mickey's eyes look like that. He has a falling out with the gang's leader, Donnie, who leads to a high-octane knife fight one night that's interrupted when they hear police sirens. All the dicks scramble and Mickey and Donnie put their fight on hold to get away. Mickey evades the cops, but eventually ends up cornered in a dead-end alley. He meets a mysterious man, reminiscent of Slugworth from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, who offers to help Mickey escape from the police of... Get this sentence. He meets a mysterious man, reminiscent of Slugworth from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, who offers to help Mickey escape from the police in his van, if he'll hear him out on a job offer he wants to give him. Mickey reluctantly accepts, having no other choice. He gets in the van, and as it drives away, we see the VGV logo on the side. End of flashback one. Flashback two. Both of Mickey's parents die in a car accident when he's a kid and he became a problem child. The boss, whose real name is Homer Bossman at the time, was Mickey's school principal. The boss takes Mickey under his wing and coaches Mickey in a retro arcade game tournament. Donkey Kong or some shit, I don't know. Mickey loses to Donnie, who at the time is a junior member of the Dicks, which is currently run by Donnie's older brother. Mickey thinks Donnie's brother is cool and wants to join, but the boss tries to warn him not to, wiping the makeup off his face to reveal that he has the same ink tattoo. Mickey is still persuaded by their offer of a better life, so he rejects the boss's guidance and joins. In Flashback 3, Mickey wakes up in VGV after the events of Flashback 1 and meets June and Eric. We find out that Slugworth is the VGV CEO, and Bossman suggested Mickey to him as part of VGV's initiative to shift towards slave labor exclusively. Other tidbits of stuff if the series had gone on. The VGV building probably would have walked around on giant mech legs at some point. As of Season 2, the show would have been 100% not about video games anymore. Eric was going to go through a story arc where he was going to try to act more like Mickey to impress June. Uh, there was going to be a competing company called College Gamer Videos who also kidnapped a criminal named Stacy the Bitch. And her and Mickey fall in love, but all they ever do is yell at each other violently and have angry sex. Uh, Junior from the Jerry series was going to be a junior member of the Dicks who idolized Mickey. I fooled around with the idea of the VGV CEO being an alien or something, so the VGV would all be some kind of insidious world domination plot. Uh, but I can never make it work without being incredibly predictable and stupid, so I doubt that would have happened. Mickey's primary objective was going to be to escape from VGV so he could find Donnie and kill him. He either would have accepted his fate and learned to live happily with June and Eric, or been released by the boss out of the grounds that he tries to turn his life in the real world around in some way. And this is all true. Only now as I write this down do I realize how hacky this all sounds. But it's hard to make these kinds of ideas sound good on paper. I think it would have been somewhat bearable in execution, but I guess we'll never know. Mwah. 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 <laughs> Mwah. In hindsight, the series follows a similar trajectory to the Dot Move series in scale, but the amount of thought that went into the future of this story might have been antithetical to what made it work in the first place. While Max has his mind in the right place, giving Mickey a nemesis and making the boss his principal might be jumping the shark a bit. 
Having Eric try to impress June is also something that would have been contentious in the eyes of viewers. Having Eric try to impress June is also something that would have been contentious in the eyes of viewers. I admire the aspirations that Max had for this series, but this also reeks of too much ambition, especially for what he may have been capable of at the time. Despite how it may have been more narratively cohesive, the ambiguous nature of what happens to the characters gives more credence to its commentary. Then again, it wasn't this series that he needed to stretch his legs in the meta-narrative department. That would come much, much later. Max G's most recent series of videos aren't too much of a departure from wacky game jokes. Both have a very thin interconnected story with a cast of characters and their interactions that make up the bulk of the narrative. Like I said before, Max and Mickey have very similar character arcs, ones where they open up to the audience, which reveal what the creator's feeling. That isn't without saying that Max G is just an animated and exaggerated version of himself in Brain Dump, making this correlation evident. What I respect about Max G is his ability to never insult the audience's intelligence. At first glance, his parodies and brain dump videos are often seen as goofy while being a bit masturbatory. But it's the subtle subtext and meta narratives that Max can weave into his videos that should be considered. Dream Drama Explained 2020 is arguably Max G at his most adept in this regard. His lack of care regarding the actual title and supposed subject matter of the video allow Max to spill his heart out, giving a nuanced perspective on the perpetual grind that is creating content for YouTube. Max G knew that, for all intents and purposes, the title would do gangbusters in the algorithm. He even calls attention to the title of that video being clickbait by using a visual gag to represent a script that would end up being that actual video. You can't say this video is clickbait when all the information pertaining to the title and thumbnail is technically on screen right now in the video. Look, there it is, right there. Of course, if you know Max and his content, that video would have never been about that to begin with. Nor would you have been able to guess that that's what he was going to go for in the first place. Max G's use of YouTube as a platform is parallel to how he presented wacky game jokes. The medium is the message. There's something often lost in translation when making YouTube content. In order to get the best success, one must be concise and simple in one's intents and messages. And the way that Max does it, YouTube often doesn't facilitate the layered storytelling that Max loves to create. Brain Dump is successful, not just in part to its animation style, but because Max G's understanding of how to manipulate YouTube to his own advantage. At the expense of sounding extremely pretentious, Max is the character Mickey would have grown into, one who understands more of what's going on and learns how to adapt. Max's use of irony is laden throughout his work. Max G making fun of himself each video while briefly engaging with whatever the title of the video is is fantastic content. Brain Dump allows his fans and detractors to engage with him in a very interesting and different way. While his fans wait for his next video upload with bated breath, his detractors view him as a spectacle. What crazy shit will he say next? It's the same thing with Mickey the Dick. He's looking to get a reaction out of you, whether or not it represents his actual attitudes or not. So Aaron, uh, my next question is, um, wh uh, wh why, why are you gay? Why are you gay, Aaron? But for those who frequently follow him, Max weaves a meta-narrative around himself, which is not very subtle with the most recent episodes. What used to be a review show is now a self-deprecated examination of his own psyche while also showcasing his animation and storytelling talents. I need to learn to be happy no matter what my life is like. There are people with much worse lives than you who are happy. I know. I know. I know. If Wacky Game Jokes had a season two, it wouldn't have been a commentary on video game culture, but maybe an exploration of Max's true storytelling chops. It's unfortunate that Wacky Game Jokes for Kids isn't talked about as much as it should be. The layered characters and narrative gave Max G the vehicle to make a few poignant criticisms directed at gaming culture, and his storytelling capabilities carried over from Wacky Game Jokes to Brain Dump. I know that he delisted them on his own channel, but I do suggest that you go watch the series on Newgrounds or some of the re-uploads found in this playlist. While some of the aspects like the humor are a bit antiquated, and I shouldn't have to tell you this if you've watched it because Jesus Christ. Mickey, why do you hate video games so much? <laughs> because video games are video gay. They are head up the ass retarded. I can't speak to everyone's tastes, but I think Max G is extremely talented. 
and I think it was high time somebody recognized the greatness of one of his earlier works. I think it's also important to watch Wacky Game Jokes for Kids to understand where Max G is now on YouTube, even if it was for better or for worse. They're about video games. Mickey also plans his media escapes. It's wacky game jokes for kids. Oh.